Still staying cool in here? Still all right? Okay, good, good, good. Um, so we come today uh, to a message uh, called Living Discipleship. Uh, I wanted to talk about discipleship today because discipleship is one of those words, uh, like I told you with the Romans series, uh, we're building a foundation together still as pastors and people, uh, and I want us to build our foundation uh, on the solid rock of Jesus. And discipleship is one of those things. It means a lot to be a disciple, but it's also one of those words that we throw around. Maybe we sing old hymns and we read in our Bible and say, oh, we want to be disciples. And then it's 2019 and no one uses the word disciple anymore, so we go, I don't really know what that means. I'm just, I'm, I'm doing it. This, this is how I be a disciple, right? But we don't maybe know what that means. So I want to talk to you today about what it means to be a disciple. Uh, and now, you know, in, in 2019, we've changed this word around, and depending on what church you go to, the denomination you belong to, we might use a lot of different words for it. I know church I grew up in, we didn't say disciple, we said fully devoted follower of Christ, you know. Uh, and we obviously, our tradition go through confirmation of our baptism and things like that. So we become confirmands uh, and things like that. But whatever word you use, what we're really talking about is being a committed student and follower of Christ. And the word disciple has within it the connotation of being a student. You are learning a discipline and therefore you become a disciple. So I wanted to look at what does discipleship look like? And I wanted to use the original lens, at least of the Christian faith, which is when Jesus called his disciples, which was the scripture that was uh, read for us uh, a moment ago. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into a lake, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said, come follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once, they left their nets, and they followed him. This is one of those stories that in 2019, if we read it as written, that's a weird story. We don't acknowledge in church sometimes enough how, like, just reading the stories are weird if we put ourselves in the place of the characters in the story. So I want to give you an example. We all just talk about what we wanted to do for a living. Uh, when we were kids, or now we think about what we do now. We're teachers, we're farmers, we work in an office building, whatever it is that you do. Imagine, tomorrow morning, we go to work. About 11 o'clock, some guy rolls in, and he says, hey, you know what you should do? You should follow me. I'll send you out. We'll get some other people. They'll all follow me, too, and we'll go change the world. Who's leaving their job tomorrow at 11? Nobody. You're going, all right, Charlie Manson, I've seen this story. I know how this ends. I do not want to be a part of whatever it is you're selling. So we have to look at, first of all, how uncomfortable uh, that might be and how dramatic it is that the disciples, as we know them, immediately left their nets and walked away. See, because we're looking at it with, with 2019 eyes, but I want to take you into their world for a minute, going into their lives, because context is really important. What do we know about these guys? They were fishing. They were fishing and Jesus comes up and says, hey, follow me, I will make you a fisher of people. Jesus was setting himself up to be a, a rabbi, a teacher in this moment. And if you understand that, what the disciples do makes so much more sense. So here's what happened. Education at the time of Jesus was a, a, a duty of the synagogue mostly. You know, the churches. The churches is where you would go to get education on the Torah, you learn the scriptures, you learn the law. And after you reached about the age of 14 or 15, uh, if, you, if you were just a promising, awesome student, you would be in the category of people who would go on and become the priests and the Pharisees or whatever. This happened at about 15. If you were the most promising student, you would go on and you follow a specific rabbi you become part of their little cluster, and that rabbi would teach you all the wisdom uh, that they had. So I have this quote from, from a book that I was reading. Uh, promising students would go on to secondary school known as Beha Midrash, which uh, I probably pronounced terribly, but it was the house of study. Here, the rabbis conducted theological discussions. These academies uh, had more sanctity than even the synagogue. Under the leadership of the rabbi, students uh, discussed the interpretation of the Torah and its application. This is where you went if you were the brightest mind of your day. 
it was, it was considered even more sacred than your church because this is where the smart folks came and talked about God. And they'd follow a certain pastor or a certain rabbi and they'd learn all that he had to say about God and the law, but only if you were the best of the best. So we already know something when we meet Jesus' disciples because are they sitting behind the rabbi somewhere? No. They're fishing. They're fishing. That means that they have started a career or at least an apprenticeship. We often forget the disciples were probably 18, maybe 19 years of old age. Most of them, they were fairly young. Uh, the oldest of them was supposed to be married, so maybe he was in his 20s. Uh, but they were a fairly young group of men just starting their lives, just starting to work. But they're laborers. They're laborers. They didn't cut it in the system that was built out. They weren't the ones who were supposed to discuss the deep theological conversations of the day. They were grunts. Now, I would say that. Fishing's an important job. We'll talk more. All, every, I mean, there's a lot of noble jobs out there. But in terms of the church in this day, these guys didn't have it, so they went out to work a normal job. And yet, and yet, when Jesus comes, to call his first disciples, to call the first people who will follow him, did he go to the synagogue? Did he go to the temple? Did he go looking for the priestly class? No, the first people he looked for were regular people working their regular jobs, starting their career out on a boat as fishermen. Here is my first point that I want you to remember and take away today when it comes to discipleship. A disciple is a called person and God is in the business of not calling the most qualified people. God is in the business of making the most called people qualified. Okay? And I want you to hear that. I want you to take that with you. Because so often in the church, when we think about our work in the church, our discipleship, what we learn in the church, we start to think of all the reasons that we can't do things. We're in that time of year where we're, we're looking for volunteers, people that like, you know, teach branching out or Sunday school classes, things like that. And you always hear the call. I don't I don't know my Bible well enough for that. I don't like kids enough for that. That's a real one. I don't have the energy for that. I can't do that. I I wouldn't know what to say if I did that. So often we'll ask people, won't you stop? Would you teach an adult class? Would you would you stand up and just share something God has done for you? And we hear so much. Well I can't. I don't know. I can't. Because we don't believe enough in ourselves that God is doing an awesome thing in us and will give us the strength and power to do something. But I'm here to tell you, God is not calling the qualified, He's qualifying the call. God likes to take people who have the heart for what He wants to do and then give them the resources to build the movement. So when Jesus Himself was coming to pick His people, His tribe, His disciples, he didn't go for the smartest, the brightest, the most intellectual and best in the temple. No, he went for the hard-working people, the regular people, who he knew could receive a message that God's love was for everyone. I can't talk to that person. I can't do those things. I could never serve on council. I could never, I could never, I could never. But God took fishermen and said, your identity and your livelihood that you had wrapped up in being a fisherman, that's not all I'm doing with you. I'm doing something bigger, and you have the opportunity to now join in this new movement, even though the church of the day did not think you were qualified for the deep conversations. I love this. It's something you've probably seen. It's shared on Facebook sometimes. It's been out on email exchange. If you've never heard it, it's funny. We often think that we're not good enough to do the work that God has. We're not uh, holy enough or we're not educated enough or whatever to do the work that God has. But if you look at the who's who of the Bible, uh, it's really just a laundry list of the most unqualified people who we now consider Bible heroes. Uh, once again, I found this online. Noah was a drunk. Abraham was too old. Jacob was a liar. Moses had a stutter. Gideon was a coward. Samson was a womanizer. David was an adulterer and had his best man murdered. Elijah was suicidal. Jonah ran from God. Peter denied Christ. Martha worried about everything. 
Zacchaeus was short. Paul had people killed. And if none of that is enough, Lazarus was dead. <laughs> Those are the people that God chose to work on his behalf. Those are the people who God said, let me prop you up and you will be the foundation of the very faith that I put in my people. So this is what I'm telling you today. If you want to be a disciple today, if you want to take that next step, don't let anything about what you think you can and cannot do dissuade you from moving forward in what God has called you to do. Because God is not calling the qualified. He is qualified. He's interrupted, he meets Jesus, 
And when that happens, he goes on to write the bulk of the New Testament. He goes from being Christianity's biggest enemy to its biggest cheerleader overnight. So if you're called today, I want you to know that there's a responsibility to sort of change who we are and go where God tells us. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, deny their own wants, deny what they think their lives is, and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save a life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will save it. If you give up everything about your life that you think you're supposed to be and focus on what God wants you to be, you will gain the life that comes with Jesus Christ. So a disciple is called, a disciple is transformed, and then a super important one, a disciple is sent out. This is such an awesome moment in Jesus' ministry, right at the end. He looks at his disciples and he says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, for surely I am with you always to the end of the earth. So great. So great. Because what do we believe about Jesus? We believe that Jesus was God in the flesh. So the disciples have watched and followed as miracles happened. Lives are changed. The dead were raised with Lazarus. And now Jesus looks at them and says, Okay, I did it. Your turn. You guys go do it too. And you can almost imagine the disciples sitting there, once again, you know, these students of the game going, um, You have a lot more resources than we do to keep this going. We're, we're not... Once again, we're not equipped. We can't do what you do, Jesus. We're not wired like you. We don't have it like you. You're, you're God's son. You're connected to holiness. We don't have that. And, and Jesus still gives them this thing. He's like, no, you are now the people of God. You are now the ones who have the sacred duty to go out and share it with others. If you believe it, go do it. Once again, we're getting ready for school. What's the favorite thing that can happen for a teacher? To teach someone so well that they can do it without you. It's the best thing that can happen for a teacher. The best thing for a pastor, I'll tell you this right now, I'm starting my ministry right now. The best thing for a pastor is I will be so good at teaching the church how to be the church that y'all don't need me someday. That's the best thing that can ever happen in this church. That's the truth. Because the mark of a good teacher is that the lessons taught change the people until they can handle it themselves and they can do it. So while we sit back and say, whoa, 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 we're not ready, we're not equipped, Jesus tells us, no, you go, do, and be that. Follow the commandments. Teach people how to live what I have taught you. And what did Jesus teach them? Love your neighbor. Love God and love your neighbor. Worship God. Worship your neighbor. There, there's a great story uh, that, once again, comes out of the Jewish faith. There's some, you know... There's some weird translations back and forth, but I'll share it with you right now. Uh, there was an old saying in Jewish writings that to be a student of the wise, you would take the wise and you would let thy house be a meeting place for the wise. You'd powder thyself in the dust of their feet and you'd drink their words. It comes from the Mishnah. And, and modern commentators have interpreted and used it in illustrations. But what the, the crux of it was, it sort of turns into this saying. Either... Let the dust of the feet of the sages, the rabbis, the teachers cover you, that you're following them so closely, or some other people have interpreted it as, that you sit so closely to the feet of your teacher, as you know, they sit in a stool and you sit on the ground, that the dust of your teacher's feet is on you all the time. Whichever way it ends up being interpreted, the meaning is the same. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi, covered in the dust of your teacher. Once again, you're talking about first century uh, uh, Judaism here. You're talking about first century uh, in the Middle East. It's a lot of dust, a lot of desert. You can imagine if you were walking behind a teacher for days and days and days, you'd be covered in whatever was coming off their shoes every time you took a step. So the mark of a good student was when they would get to a town, You'd see the rabbi, then you'd see his students, and his students would be covered in dust, or once again, or he'd be teaching, and their faces would be covered in dust from sitting, and you'd go, that's a good student, because they've been following their rabbi for a long time, very, very closely. So it led to this phrase that, that people share now, may the dust of your rabbi be on your face, may the dust of your teacher be on your face. Because if someone's covered in dust from walking so closely to someone, 
They're marked. You can't avoid it. You would notice. Who's the weird guy covered in dust? Oh, he's a student. It's fine. People would notice. So that's our challenge as disciples. When we say we're set out, we're supposed to be so covered and marked by the things that Jesus taught us about how to love God and love one another. That if someone sees us, they notice it immediately. They say something's different there about him or about her. They've been transformed. They look different because they're just covered in the dust of our Savior. Our devotion is literally on our face. A disciple is called. A disciple is transformed. And then a disciple is sent out. Jesus doesn't give this as a suggestion. He says, I speak with authority to you. Go tell others about what you've experienced. Go tell others how to be more Christ-like. You want people to know you're a good student of me? Be transformed and then go transform others. Stop being a student. Go be the teacher. So church, we have a challenge. If we're disciples, we have to go out and share the love of Christ, share the knowledge of Christ. And I believe that calling is on us today. So if you've been called, are you transformed? If you're transformed, are you ready to go out? And if you're ready to go out, are you ready to change the world? Because the message of Jesus Christ changes everything. Let us do God's kingdom work this day. Amen. Let us pray. Great God, as, as we come to the end of our time together, we share in communion and we remember the sacrifice you made for us on that cross. Lord, all of us want to be your disciples. We want to grow closer to you. We want to know you better. And we pray, Lord, that, that like those slogans, you know, they just left or the dust of our rabbi's feet, that people will see us do extraordinary things to serve you, to honor you, to acknowledge our devotion to you. Then we'd be ready to do those things, even when they're difficult, even when they involve leaving behind something of ourselves. As we go out in the world, may people see less and less of us, Lord, and see more and more of you. We ask this to stay as well.